This morning's gospel is what I've decided to talk about today, and I have to be honest with you, it was a struggle. We hear this reading every three years, and I thought to myself, what could I possibly add for those who know the story of the Samaritan woman at the well? But in today's current climate, I thought it would be important to talk about the fact that this woman was an outcast. And we know this from the gospel for several reasons. First of all, she comes to draw water at noon, and she comes by herself. Now at the time, women went to draw water communally. It was a community activity, and you did it first thing in the morning, so that you would have water in, throughout the day. Also the fact that she had had five husbands, and is currently living with a man who is not her husband. So she was not accepted by the people of her village. The Samaritans, we need to talk a little bit about the Samaritans. There are some interesting things going on in today's gospel. First of all, Samaria was the region between Israel and Galilee, and at what would be today the West Bank. And the Samaritans were, they considered themselves the true followers of the law. In fact, the word Samaritan comes from a Jewish word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. That it means the guardians, the watchers, the keepers of the law. And during the Assyrian conquest, they were not carried into captivity, but remained behind. Now the Jews of the time period thought that the Samaritans were half pagan because during the conquest, the region that the Samaritans lived in were colonized by Assyrians. There were also differences between the, what the Samaritans believed were the words of God and what the Jews of the time period believed. The Samaritans believed in only the first five books of the Bible, whereas obviously the Jews included the prophets, the Psalms, and the historical books. And finally, there was differences over where to worship. The Samaritans chose to worship at Mount Gerizim, which was a mountain set aside by Joshua at the time of the conquest for the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle was removed from there to Jerusalem, those people who were descended from the, uh, who became the Samaritans, thought that this was a violation of God's original intent. So there was a lot of conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans of the day. Now what's unique about Jesus is that he's actually in Samaria. When people traveled from Israel to Galilee, they would not go through Samaria. They would cross the River Jordan, go up the East Bank, and once hit Galilee, cross the River Jordan again. So here we have this really unique situation of Jesus, first of all, being in Samaria, something that the Jews of his time period did not do. Secondly, and the woman says this, He's actually talking to a Samaritan and a woman. Again, something Jewish men of that time period did not do. And so you have this really unique situation going on of Jesus specifically talking to someone who was an outcast on every level. A fallen woman, if you would. Someone who has been uh, derided by her own community. And a Samaritan. And so she comes to draw water, and then we get to the intent of the uh, author of the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, there are seven signs in which Jesus reveals himself, and the first one is the living water of God. Obviously, in the Middle East, water was symbolic of life. They only lived where they could find water. And so Jesus is presenting himself to this woman as the source of living water. And her response is immediate. Sir, give me of this water that I may drink of it and not have thirst again. And I wonder how many times in our own life we've heard the words of God and our response is not immediate or if we're even let paying attention. It's immediate. And then, once hearing the words, she immediately goes to the community that she's an outcast of. And says, come and see this man who has told me everything about myself, everything I have done. 
Could he be the one? Could he be the Messiah? Because the Samaritans were also looking for a Messiah a little bit differently than the Jews of the time period. They were expect, where the Jews were expecting the reincarnation of David. The Samaritans were looking for the reincarnation of Moses. But they still anticipated a Messiah that would lead the world into salvation. Could he be the one? And then you have something really, really interesting going on. This woman, who was an outcast in her own society, they believed her. Many came to believe for the words she had spoken. Now think of the power of that belief. Obviously they saw a change in her. This woman who had to draw water by herself, and the Samaritans were very strict followers of the Levitical cult. She had had five husbands and was living with a man she was not married to. And then that she still was transformed enough to have the courage to step forward to this community and said, you have to see this guy. And the gospel points out that they, many believed on her testimony before they actually went out to hear Jesus himself. And so what is the lesson in all of that for us today? What can we learn from that in living in 2017? I kind of talk about, I, I, I had to think, you know, how can I make this relevant to all of us? What, what does this mean to David? What does this mean to you? I guess the way I would look at it is God takes us where we are. There is no condemnation in Jesus at all. He just simply points out the reality. Truly, you have spoken right. For you don't have a husband. You have five husbands, and the one you're living with is not your husband. But there's no condemnation in that. He doesn't then say, turn away from your sins. He just points out, I recognize where you are. And then he offers her, offers her the eternal living water. So we, in our lives, there are times where we might feel like we're not worthy. Like right now, I don't feel. <laughs> what can I offer you? But God uses us in our current state and where we are. He doesn't expect us to instantly become a perfect person. He knows that's not possible. So when you wonder, what can I offer? Don't worry about it. God will take you where you are right now. And once you turn yourself over to him, in whatever capacity that may be, you will become a witness to those around you. As she was. Many came to believe because of her words. And then, once you're willing to open yourself up to the eternal living waters, Provided to us through Jesus, we can become an instrument of reconciliation. We reconcile ourselves to God as she was, and we can help others reconcile themselves to God. But more importantly, we can reconcile ourselves to others. Notice she's accepted by her community. They believed her. She wasn't an outcast any longer. And what's really interesting about the Gospel of John is that the two, she is the prototypical missionary. She's the first person in the Gospel, in any Gospel, where simply on her words alone, people came to believe in Jesus. <laughs> on her words. Not Jesus himself, her, she's in the fourth chapter. And in the Gospel of John, of course, the other one, Mary, the first one to proclaim the message that Jesus had risen from the dead. Those are only in the Gospels of John. It's only in the Gospel of John that you find this story, and it's only in the Gospel of John where Mary is the first one to proclaim Jesus Christ. So for all of us in today's world, you know, I was really tempted to preach on the letter from Birmingham Jail, but I thought, no, it will turn into a political rant. <laughs> I tend to think there was a prophet, a woman who was running, you know, who didn't get elected. So I didn't want to preach about that. 
But um, my encouragement to you today, during this season of Lent, is to drink freely of the waters of life. Open yourself to the words of Jesus. Reconcile yourselves to those in your family, your friends, to those people in your life where there might be currently a division. And you'll have to do it first, like she did. And then all of us may have the full blessings of Easter. May God be with all of you.